Um, okay, uh, a little, a couple announcements about the exam. Uh, people are asking me about how to find information and uh, things about the review sessions. So I just wanted to just remind you um, of a few things. So first of all, Mike isn't having SI today, so there's no SI this afternoon, but he will hold his SI session on Wednesday at 4.30, um, and I'm sure he'll be doing a lot of exam review during that time. I will have a review session in this room on Thursday starting at 3.30. If you can't make it right at 3.30, you can come whenever you want. Um, I have the room reserved until 5.30, and we'll review material and I'll answer questions and I'll stay as long as uh, you want until, until uh, we use the room at 5.30 if you have questions. So as long as you have questions for me, we'll be here. Uh, also, I do have my normal office hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10.30, so uh, feel free to come to those. And if you do need any additional help, um, just check to see if I'm around, because I do have some other time available this week. Uh, I do have a fair number of old exams that you can practice. I, it, it was for a different book, but the content is pretty much the same, if you look at the exam one content. Uh, I did put a link on it on the exams page, and um, there's a message on Blackboard with a link right to the page where the 2007 exams are. Um, if you haven't been able to find it by following through clicking the links to my old web pages, sometimes they're a little hard to find, so you can find those there. Also, some other practice exams that the SI leader then uh, had put up for students. So feel free to go through those, and uh, if you have questions about them, just let me know. Uh, the exam, I have both the blank exams and the exam with the answers filled out in the key. So you can try to do it and then uh, see if your answers match the key. I imagine, I haven't written the exam yet, but the format for the exam will be very similar to what I've done in the past. Um, it's not going to be all multiple choice or anything like that. It is short answer and you'll have to draw structures and uh, there will be different aspects to that exam. Uh, can you tell me what are these isomers or not isomers, things like that, comparative questions. So take a look at the old exams, that will be a good resource for you. Okay, any questions on the exam on Friday? All right. Uh, well, let's continue talking about cycloalkanes. Last week we talked a lot about the structures of cycloalkanes and how tying the uh, ring together inhibits free rotation and has impacts on the energy of the molecule and the conformations it can adapt. So remember, cyclopropane has no motions available to it and it's fixed in, in a very high energy conformation where all the bonds are eclipsed and uh, the angle strain is very high. And the ability for the molecule to twist and move changes as the ring sizes get larger. And so you can alleviate some of that high strain if you go to cyclobutane, you alleviate a little bit of that and cyclopentane, then you can pucker that molecule a little more so you don't have so much torsional uh, eclipsing interactions, and cyclohexane. So we were, we were talking a lot about cyclohexane on Friday. Uh, so just to remind you, the cyclohexane structure is the lowest energy of the ring structures because there is no additional energy uh, strain put into it because of torsion or bond angle strain. And that's because all the bonds can adopt, at least in this chair conformation, uh, the most favorable positions. Okay? All of the uh, hydrogens are um, not eclipsing, they're completely staggered in the middle, and all the bond angles are as ideal as what that molecule would want to be if it were a linear molecule. Um, and this structure, this conformation, or chair structure, is the lowest energy conformation for cyclohexane. And this conformation actually puts the hydrogens in the molecule in different um, regions of space that have different steric encumbrances. So the pink hydrogens here, if you recall, are sticking straight up or straight down. Those are what we refer to as the axial positions. And they are more crowded, whereas the equatorial positions, which are indicated here in blue, are sticking out away from the plane of the ring and are, are less crowded. There's less uh, groups close to it. Which isn't that significant of a problem if we're talking about things that are small, like a hydrogen. Okay? But as we start to ex 
for the confirmations of cyclohexane. When we put on larger groups, then that makes a big difference, what orientation it's in. So uh, here's the top view. Uh, we took a look at that on uh, Friday. Um, and the molecule, six-membered ring molecule, is large enough of a ring that you can get some bond rotation and flip from one chair structure to another. Okay. Um, and remember, what happens when this conformational change takes place, switching from one chair structure to another, is every position on the ring, which was axial in one conformation, is flipped to equatorial in the other conformation. And vice versa, everything that was originally equatorial, when it undergoes a ring flip, it is now in its axial position. So every position changes. Okay, and as, you, as that molecule uh, undergoes those motions, uh, flipping from one chair conformation to the other, it's not just a, a direct uh, energy hump, if you will. There are several conformations if you look at the uh, confirmation of the molecule frozen in various aspects. There are several uh, confirmations which are high in energy. Um, the boat structure is sort of a local uh, lower energy than the actual highest one, um, but certainly much higher in energy than the chair confirmations. So as that molecule undergoes the motions that was depicted by that movie I just showed you, that's actually the energy profile that's happening as the molecule is flipping. Okay. That energy difference uh, is not that great if all you have are hydrogens on there. And if all of the positions on the ring are identical, all the groups on the ring, so we have uh, 12 hydrogens on this ring, there's no difference in energy from this chair conformation to the other chair conformation. Okay? How many people over the weekend practice drawing chair structures? All right, we got one. Um, I would encourage you to, to uh, draw chair structures. Remember some of the rules I was talking about that helps you draw them. For example, start with the two middle bonds. And when we have a chair structure, uh, the one that's lower on the page is the one closer to us in space because we're looking side on. So it doesn't matter if you draw a chair starting from the top down. I'll draw two chairs side by side. Draw two parallel lines angling down, um, or you could draw two parallel lines angling up. It doesn't really matter. Then fill in the, the corners where they meet. So if on this left here, uh, this is angling up towards the left, then what I want to do is come down on the left side and go up on the right side. Okay, not the best chair, but uh, not bad. Notice again, these bonds are parallel to each other, these bonds are parallel to each other, and this one and this one are parallel to each other. If I had started my chair structure, drawing it angling up to the right, I just do the opposite. So instead of going down on the left, I would go up on the left and down on the right. Okay, that's the best way to draw a chair. Ooh. It looks terrible, doesn't it? I tried. Um, okay, now, identifying the axial and equatorial position. So, how do you decide what bonds go straight up and down and what bonds go out? Best thing to do is start with the axial bonds. Okay, so if I just take this structure on the right, again, any on this chair skeleton, Wherever two bonds meet and it's pointing up, you draw a bond straight up. And where two bonds meet and point down, you draw a bond straight down. So this is an up position, that's axial. This is uh, closer to us in the front, so I'm going to exaggerate that. That's in front of the bond behind it. And there's the third axial position on the top. So remember, we have three axial positions up and three axial positions down, and it alternates from one carbon to the next as you go around the ring. So the points that are pointing down, there's a hydrogen there, there's a hydrogen there, and in the back, 
There's a hydrogen there. Okay, that's all six carbons with the, with the axial position identified. Okay, I'm going to switch color here, maybe to green. How about green? Okay, the equatorial hydrogens then uh, go out away. I like to do the two ends are the easiest because you just draw them up in a way like that. Uh, this one comes towards us a little bit. And that one's going away from us here and coming towards us there. That's how you draw those equatorial positions that I've indicated here in green. Uh, keep in mind again, those equatorial positions are parallel with bonds that are in the ring. So uh, let's see if I can use another color. I'll just use gray. So for example, this bond is parallel with that bond. I'm going to make this so marked up you won't be able to see it, right? And this bond. So all of those bonds are parallel. Uh, and this one. Okay. This bond is parallel with these. I shouldn't use the same color, but hopefully you can follow as I draw. And this bond is parallel with uh, those as well. This one and this one are parallel with the two red ones that I haven't done. And I completely obliterated that molecule. You can't see what I did anymore. Um, Okay, let me get rid of some of this. Okay, now I drew this chair conformation starting in two different ways. On the left side and the right side, that is the ring flip of each other. If you, if you map this carbon over to this carbon, what I've drawn on the right is essentially the ring flipped structure for that. Okay, so notice uh, let me just go to the point that's over here, on the, all the way on the right side, okay? And just focus on that. We have two axial positions, but we have an up position and a down position. So on that carbon, is the up or the top of the ring equatorial or axial? This carbon here. There's, there's two positions, right? There's a down position and an up position. But the down position, since it's at an apex of two bonds going towards the bottom, then your axial position has to be down. Your equatorial position has to be up. So that's the up position. And this is the down position. Axial, okay? Axial and equatorial. And notice, if you map the carbon here, and you undergo a ring flip, right? This is now pointing down. That's that end of the molecule. So what used to be axial, hydrogen that I've written blue here, is now equatorial in this molecule. And if I fill out all those positions on that molecule, you'd see that's the same thing for each one of those. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. How about something that's not in your book? What do you think would happen to the conformation of the molecule if I had, instead of cyclohexane, I'm just drawing the flat structure here, I had cyclohexene. Would the structure be a chair structure, like we have with cyclohexane? Any guesses? I have one no. You have a 50 50 chance, right? Yes, it's the same chair structure, or no, it's a different structure. But what have we done now by introducing a double bond? We've changed the hybridization of the carbons there. So if we no longer have sp3, we have two carbons now, which are sp2 hybridized. Okay? That has a different three-dimensional structure, right? What is the geometry of an sp2 atom? It's planar. That's right. It's flat. So it's, those are no longer tetrahedral. It's now flat. 
That, and, and you don't need to really know this for the exam. I just want to point out because I want you to be thinking about this later. You change the hybridization of the atoms and you change the structures it can adopt. And uh, for those that are really interested, um, we have a double bond, which is completely planar. So if I'm looking at the side, we have two hydrogens coming out and bonds going to the back. That's all lining in one plane. So if you wanted the ring, then those carbons are tetrahedral. So it looks more like that. It's kind of like a, a half twisted chair kind of. But the, 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 the thing is that you have two planar atoms that molecule now, it will change the structure. So I just want you to be aware that hybridization does change the structure. When we're talking about these six-membered ring cyclohexanes, we see these chair structures because they are all sp3 hybridized. Okay. Okay. Let's well, let's move on and talk about what happens when we start to substitute positions on that ring. Because now, if we have groups which are larger than hydrogen, now the position it's on on that ring, axial or equatorial, matters a lot because the axial positions are more crowded. Um, and I think this is about where we left off on Friday, right? You have a CH3 group, which, which I've shown one chair structure on the left, is coming close in space to the other two hydrogens that are three carbons away. So if I count this carbon one, that hydrogen will be three carbons away. Or if I go back this way, one, two, three, that hydrogen is three carbons away. We refer to that as a 1-3 diaxial interaction. Okay. That is sterically encumbered, then the energy is higher. If the molecule flips now, the ring flip, and this swings down, that methyl group is now sticking out in the equatorial position. It's much less crowded there. Okay, the other two hydrogens that I've shown, I've just drawn the hydrogen specific on the carbons I showed previously, but the equatorial positions, I'm sorry, the axial positions now on the top of the ring are those hydrogens. So we have a situation where the only groups which occupy axial positions are hydrogens. Okay, the larger group is in a region of space which is more open to it. And so this is uh, 1.8 kilocalories per mole lower in energy or more stable than the conformation on the left. So although it may be not enough energy at room temperature to be completely one conformation, both are existing, there's going to be a higher population of the lower energy state. Does that make sense? Higher population. The greater the difference in energy between conformations, the greater the difference in that population. And so you can get to a point where at room temperature, 99.99% of your molecules are going to be in one conformation over another, if that energy difference is great enough. In mass case, 1.8 kilocalories per mole is not that huge. So uh, I don't know exactly know what the ratio is, but uh, it's you know, it's going to be more of the more stable, but then you're going to have some of the less stable. So each, each 1-3 diaxial interaction here is adding 0.9 kilocalories per mole. Um, there's a term we use, we call it an A value, referring to the energy for each of these 1-3 diaxial interactions. And the A value for a methyl group is 0 0.9 kilocalories per mole. Okay, so you might hear me refer to the A value, referring to the axial interaction energy with the hydrogen. Okay. Well, here's a, a picture that we uh, took a look at last time. It's clearly showing the extra interactions that occur when this methyl group is axial. Uh, you can see how close it comes to those hydrogens that are um, uh, around the ring, three carbons away. Uh, and that's why we have that increased energy. And if you then ring flip, 
you get this methyl group out in space where there's plenty of room for it that's no longer bumping in to hydrogen. Okay, um, before I move on, I do want to point out some of the uh, conformational interactions in the, that we see in the ring that we talked mostly about when we talked about the ethane and butane conformations, right? As we rotate, we see staggered conformations, eclipsing conformations, uh, things that are 60 degrees apart that are grouped on there are what we refer to as a gauche interaction, or if they're 180 degrees apart, it's an anti situation, right? Remember that from the butane discussion. Well, let's take a look at the six-membered ring for a moment. Um, what is the relationship between this methyl group and this bond of the ring? If you were to think about looking at, at that uh, down, let's just view it from this, down that CC bond. So we look from this carbon to this carbon. What's the relationship between this bond and this bond? And can you visualize that? It's a hard thing to do without a model and holding it there. Actually, if you, if you were to look in this direction, you would find that these are 180 degrees apart. So the CC bond of the methyl group and the CC bond of the ring are in an anti-conformation at that point. So looking down here, this will be pointing this way, this will be pointing this way, 180 degrees from front to back. And those are present all throughout the ring, these anti and gauche conformations. If uh, you look at this, uh, let me clear this, if you look at this hydrogen bond here, okay, and this bond, what's the relationship between those two? If you're looking down here, this from front to back, that's going to be 60 degrees. That's a gauche relationship, right? Remember gauche? So if the methyl group is axial, not only is it more crowded with the other axial hydrogens, there's also a gauche interaction with a bond in the ring. This one and the one in back, multiple gauche interactions. So all of that is what is adding up to this greater energy of the molecule. There's the molecule in motion. I like to watch them in motion. Lower energy, higher energy. OK. Um, once we start to put more than one group on a ring, then we have another situation. And that is we have present isomers, which are not described by our definition so far of, of things being bonded differently. Because we can have molecules which have all the atoms bonded to the same atoms, but because the ring can't freely rotate around a CC bond, um, having them both on the same side of the ring or on opposite sides of the ring, they're fixed that way. They're fixed in space. Those are different molecules and different isomers with different properties. And this is a case which we refer to as a stereoisomer. A molecule which has all the same kinds of atoms and all the same connections between them. They're all connected the same, but they're arranged differently and fixed or stuck in one particular orientation in three-dimensional space. Okay. When we refer to this with regard to cycloalkanes, uh, we use these terms. If the two substituents you're talking about are on the same side of the ring, like the top and the bottom of the ring, if you were to look at it flat, uh, then we refer to that as the cis stereoisomer. And if they're on opposite sides of the ring, that's the trans stereoisomer. So let's look at some examples of that. Uh, for example, if you take a look at cyclopropane, that's a ring, it, it can't rotate around. So if you look at something like dibromo cyclopropane, I've drawn a structure here, but I haven't shown any 
indication of his three-dimensional picture. Okay, I've just drawn it flat with, with bonds without indicating whether those bromines are up or down. But if you look at that ring, if you actually look at that more three-dimensional picture of this ring, we have hydrogens on the top and we have hydrogens on the bottom. And then if you start substituting with a bromine, let's say you put a bromine here on this carbon, replace that hydrogen with bromine, uh, you could replace this hydrogen with bromine or this hydrogen with bromine to get the other one on. The relationship between them is different. So this is what we're referring to in terms of stereoisomers, okay? Uh, this is the trans dibromo cyclopropane, and this is the cis dibromo cyclopropane. Cis, same side, trans, opposite side. Okay? If you take mo models of those molecules and superimpose them, you'll see that they're not the same, right? If you slide this molecule over, you have a bromine here on top, which would overlap where a hydrogen is on that molecule. Clearly they're different molecules. Um, and they can't interconvert by just bond rotations. Those are stereoisomers. Okay? Here's another example. They don't have to be next to each other. It's just their relationship on the face of the ring, top or bottom. Uh, and so when we draw them flat using our skeletal line structures, um, you'll see me indicate with a bold or dash, meaning up or down. So again, they could both be up, or one could be up and one could be down. What if I had both of these down? Would that be a different molecule? No, that would be the same as this, it's just been flipped over. Okay, so uh, it doesn't matter if I would write them both up or both down. Cis means they're just both on the same side, whether it's up or down. And here you can see on more perspective drawing the differences then between the cis dimethyl cyclopentane in the trans. Yes, question? On the previous slide, how did you get the number two in the ring? Ah, and actually I don't need it because there's only three carbons, um, but because they're next adjacent, if I were to number one, two, I actually don't need it for this name because there is no uh, other way to do that. Uh, but it's a good question. They are on adjacent carbons, and so if I were to number around the ring, carbon one, carbon two. Okay, if I have a case like this one, 1,2-dimethyl cyclopentane would be a different molecule. That would have a methyl group uh, on adjacent carbon, say 1 and 2. This happens to be 1, 2, 3, so you have to give the numbers here. Yes? No, no, I haven't moved it anywhere. No, it can't be 1 and 3 for the trans. We haven't changed it, so we still have two carbons adjacent, carbon one and carbon two. Carbon one and carbon two. I haven't changed the position of the bromate, I've only changed its orientation from top to bottom. It's still attached to the same carbon, and that's what you really have to make sure you get uh, and understand, because that's why it's a stereoisomer and not a constitutional isomer. I haven't moved it anywhere else, I've only switched it from uh, three-dimensional arrangement up to down. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, now what I what I want to do is take a look at the consequences of the different stereoisomers on cyclohexane conformations. Okay, so if you take a look at this case, uh, let's look at the case where I have two methyl groups on a cyclohexane now on adjacent carbons next to each other. So we have 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexane. And we just learned that once we put more than one substituent on it, we can have those oriented in different ways in three-dimensional space. They could both be on the same side of the ring, or they could be on opposite sides of the ring. In this case, here's the cis molecule, and on the bottom is the trans molecule. Those two stereoisomers have different consequences with regard to the chair conformations because of the way they orient the groups in axial or equatorial positions. So the cis molecule, if they're both on the same side of the ring, as you, as you go around the ring from one carbon to the next, 
what I'll refer to as the up position, if I were drawing it flat like this, the up position alternates axial, equatorial. The up position here will be axial, the up position equatorial. Up position axial, up position equatorial. So as you go around the ring, the top positions are alternating one to the next. Okay? And likewise from the bottom positions. So in the case of having two substituents, let me clean up some of this here. In the case of having two substituents now, two methyl groups, if they're on the same side of the ring and on adjacent carbons, we have one that's axial, the next one is equatorial. Okay? So one of the methyl groups has one three diaxial interactions. Okay? The other one doesn't. If I do a ring flip, what happens with those groups? Well, the one that was axial, if you follow this, becomes equatorial. And the one that was equatorial has now become axial. Okay, because every position switches when you do a ring flip. But we have the same situation. We have one group that now has um, two diaxial interactions, and we have one group that doesn't. And they're both the same size. They're both methyl groups. So there should be no difference in energy between those two conformations, right? We have all the same interactions and all the same energetic issues that we had in the left structure is the right structure. Yes? If we have a uh, one, two diameter, uh, uh, diameter cyclo, if we have the two, the two uh, functional groups on the, on the, on the same side, that is on the equator, yeah. Ah, it, yes. Yeah. Would it not have, would it, would it be uh, more on, um, what, what would be the energy with respect to the one that we have, we put the, the right. functional groups on the, on, on the uh, axial position? Everybody get that question? Uh, instead of having one axial and one, one equatorial, what happens if they're both equatorial? Yeah, that's the case with the other stereoisomer. So that question leads right into this situation. If instead of having them one, two, cis, we have them one, two, trans, now take a look at it. Now we have two conformations which are very different. Uh, in one of them, we have a CH3 axial and it has the one three diaxial interactions here. And the CH3 on the bottom, because it's on the opposite side of the ring, it's also axial but down, okay? And it has those same one three diaxial interactions, right? So both methyl groups are now in more crowded positions. And then if you do a ring flip, look what happens. They're both equatorial, they're both in less crowded positions. So here we have both highly crowded, and on the right, both less crowded. So obviously the one on the right is going to be a different energy, it's going to be lower in energy or more stable. Okay? So that's the case when you have both of your groups in axial positions or equatorial positions. The ring will choose to be on the side that flows in energy. And at room temperature, oh shoot, I don't know the ratio, but it's mostly this. Because now we're talking about how much energy difference between the left side and the right side. Do you know how to figure out the energy difference? I told you one methyl was 1.8 kilocalories per mole difference. We have two methyls, it's going to be double that, right? So it's going to be 3.6 kilocalories per mole different between the left side and the right side. That's a pretty significant difference in energy now. Um, and the, the, that particular conformation of the trans is going to be most stable. So does everybody understand and see what's happening in these two situations? The same molecule in terms of the connectivity, a methyl on one and a methyl on two, but two different stereoisomers will have different 
impacts in what conformation it has. This one has equal equal energy conformations in the cis uh, orientation, and in the trans orientation, they're going to be different energy conformations. Okay. Now, what happens if the methyl groups are not one two, but one three? Okay. Oh, do I have some pictures here? I should have some pictures here. Yeah, models. Okay. Here's the case where they are cis oriented. And you can see, again, one of them is axial and one is equatorial. And if you look at the top view, you can see one is axial and one is equatorial. And if you do the ring flip, they are going to be. Um, you have the same types of energy situations. If it's trans, this is the conformation with them both axial. And you can see the, this is particularly crowded here, and this one is also crowded. And if you do the ring flip, they are both sticking out equatorial. And there's more room for them. There's the top view of the equatorial. Okay. Well, if you take one of those methyl groups and move it one more carbon down, down the ring, and now we have them situated one and three. One, a methyl group on carbon one, and a methyl group on carbon three. We have a cis and a trans, and the energies are exactly opposite. Again, it's because axial equatorial, axial equatorial alternates from one to the next. So instead of one, two, where the cis had one axial and one equatorial, now if they're on the same side of the ring, both of them are up, axial. So here it's the cis molecule where we have two of them crowded, and now this is lower energy when the ring flips. Okay, and are you following that? And if you then orient this group down and to the trans position, now we have one axial and one equatorial. And if you do a ring flip, you're going to have one of them being axial and one of them being equatorial. Okay, so in this case, it, it, so it's, it's important to understand the conformation and the concept of what happens when you flip the rings and how the orientations alternate from one carbon to the next. Because if you just remember, cis has equal energy conformations and trans has one of them both axial and one both equatorial, that's true only for the 1-2 isomer, not the 1-3 isomer. Okay, it's opposite for the 1-3 isomer. Um, and that's important to recognize. So you can see um, now this is even this is even worse because not only do we have them both axial, but we have both of the methyl groups on the same side. So the steric crowding is even greater than just if it was next to hydrogens. So this is the this is the 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 cis uh, axial and this is the cis equatorial ring flip, the lower energy. Okay. All right, so if I ask the question then, what happens if we go to the, the last constitutional isomer, the 1,4 substituted dimethyl? What would you expect? Same as 1,2, exactly. Uh, it should be the same situation as the 1,2. One, 1,2, two. One, two, both of them, uh, if they're on the same side, one is axial, one is equatorial. 1, 3, that changes. 1, 4, it goes back to like it was for 1, 2. So here you see um, uh, carbon 1 and carbon 4. One of them is axial. One is equatorial. You flip the ring. This one becomes axial and this one becomes equatorial. No difference in the interactions. So same energy confirmation. The trans, we have one which is diaxial. And one which is diagonal. 
Okay. Uh, let's see, do I have pictures of that too? I don't. Okay, uh, before I move on, it, does anybody have any questions about what I've shown so far, the relationships between those groups and how they change around the ring? So far I've been showing you things like a methyl group, um, two methyl groups, two bromines. Those are cases where we have all the same kind of group. Okay. Uh, again, it's important to understand the conformations and the positions and what happens when you flip from one chair structure to the other, particularly when we, those groups now are different sized groups, because that's also going to affect the energetic differences. So in this case, if we, if we take the same substitution pattern, 1, 4, and have, we have two groups, okay, but those groups are of different sizes, now you have a situation where one is always axial, one is always equatorial, but one of the conformations is going to be better. Because we want the larger group to be in the less crowded space. That's the lowest energy, the larger group. So if it's no longer dimethyl, but in this case I have one methyl group and one larger uh, isopropyl group, or a one methyl alkyl if you want to use IUPAC complex substituents. Now there's going to be a big difference. So here's a big crowded group that's axial and has these severe interactions, and we have a small methyl, equatorial, in that particular conformation. And if it undergoes a ring flip, we put the larger group in the more open space, and the smaller group now is the one that's in the more crowded space. So that has to be lower energy. There's less steric interactions. Okay? Uh, that a value or that axial strain energy, um, it's been determined for lots of different size groups. And you can actually go look up charts and charts and charts of various groups and see them. I just listed a few of those here. Uh, and what I'm talking about is the energy associated with that steric strain for, from one hydrogen to that group. Now re recognize that the overall energy of the molecule difference will be double that because there's a second one. Okay, so these energies refer to one. So we've been talking about methyl groups. Methyl group has that A value of uh, 0.9 kilocalories per mole. And since there are, there are two of those in each cyclohexane molecule, if it's axial, then overall the difference in the conformation will be 1.8 kilocalories per mole. Uh, this gives you some idea about relative sizes, actually, because the, the difference in energy that you see there, that diaxial interaction energy, is related to how much steric crowding there is for the most part. So if you compare things like um, a fluorine group, a fluorine group has a 1,3 diaxial interaction energy with a hydrogen of about 0.12 kilocalories per mole. Okay? Fluorine is a little bigger than a hydrogen, but it's not as crowded, it's not as big as a methyl. Okay? It's nine times less of a problem than methyl, so it's a much smaller group. And you can see if you look at chlorine, bromine, an OH group, uh, it's not that much of a difference in energy relative to uh, methyl. Methyl and ethyl are very similar. Isopropyl is 1.1. Um, once you start to get three substituents on there, like a tertiary butyl group, so this is, oh, I just made the marks all over it. So this is a group, uh, let's just say, if I were to draw an axial, which would be really big, right? So imagine how much space that would have to take up. So a tertiary butyl group, for each interaction, each hydrogen interaction is 2.7 kilocalories per mole. So double that would be 5.4. So a, a tertiary butyl group on a cyclohexane ring at room temperature 
5.4 kilocalories per mole is enough to have it more than 99% in one confirmation, where that T beetle group is equatorial and in the most uh, open space possible. Okay, now, now we're talking about enough energy to really affect the population a lot. Okay, um, I just want to mention a little bit, there are other confirmations available to uh, cyclohexane. Um, the lowest energies are the chairs, as we talked about, but the bulk confirmation sometimes is forced to be present by the virtue of having things which restrict it. For example, there's many molecules which have carbons which bridge between the uh, uh, two carbons. For example, norbornane. This is the molecule norbornane. We have a six-membered ring that's highlighted here in blue. And then a carbon here and a carbon here are attached by another carbon in between. This is what we refer to as a bicyclic molecule or a bicyclo molecule. And because of that, the only way this could be attached is if this is stuck in a boat conformation. So it's important to recognize that other aspects to the molecule and other restrictive features, like additional rings, will also impact its ability to be flexible or be fixed in one conformation, which may not, may not necessarily be ideal. So remember this boat conformation, where both of these are on the same side, or if you look down this way, you see this has a lot of torsional strain because the bonds are eclipsing. Lots of molecules uh, form six-membered rings. Here's an example. Um, sugar molecules that are hexoses, uh, like glucose. Um, here's like a linear structure of glucose. But what happens is glucose exists as a cyclic form where this oxygen forms a bond to that carbon. That's right here. And it forms a six-membered ring. Sugar molecules that are in six-membered rings adopt a chair conformation. And depending on whether the other substituents, in these cases, hydroxyl groups, are axial or equatorial, you get different sugars. Different stereoisomers are available with these various substitutions. So it's important to recognize that molecules which impact biology are also affected by conformations of the molecule. Here are some starches or polysaccharides, just for your information. They are uh, basically chair conformation six-membered rings attached with some attachments. Uh, more than one ring, we can have many types of polycyclic molecules. Uh, and you'll hear us use, us chemists use various words to describe how they're attached. So if you have a ring which is attached to another ring in a situation like this, this is what we refer to as a fused ring, where they're attached on one and two, for example. If the attachment is to the same carbon, as is shown here, this is what we refer to as a spirocyclic uh, ring. Um, and if it goes beyond, if it's not attached one, two, and fused directly, but bridging over some other carbons, that's what we refer to as bridged polycyclic molecules. And those are present in nature as well. Um, here, for example, are some fused rings. Um, this is just a, a actually a quite complicated polycyclic molecule. This is a, the skeleton of a steroid. And there are lots of steroid structures which have this basic 6665 fused ring system. And depending on how they're, how they're arranged, here's more of a three-dimensional picture of that. Notice there are individual chair structures, but they're sort of locked together. So when we really get down and analyze overall conformations of larger molecules, having a good uh, basis on understanding those six membrane ring structures is important. How much time do we have? Just another minute. I'm not going to talk much about that. I just want to say at the last, for, to finish today, um, ring molecules can contain other kinds of atoms besides carbon. And this is what we refer to as heterocyclic molecules because it has a heteroatom. Heteroatom, that term is referring to, to an atom that's not carbon. So you can see here lots of oxygen-containing uh, molecules, nitrogen-containing molecules. 
And they will have an impact on six-membered ring conformations because, for example, in oxygen, you can't have other substituents on there. It's just lone pairs. So steric issues are less sometimes in some of these types of molecules. Okay, that does finish chapter three. We're going to start chapter four on Wednesday. The exam will only cover through today's uh, lecture. Um, and I hope to have the slides uh, on the web for you for chapter four by tomorrow morning. So